This is the Equid E-Commerce Show with your host, Jesse Ness, along with Richard Ote. What's going on, Richie? What's happening, Jesse? It's that day again. It is. And hello, everybody listening. Today is a special show. It's the Jesse and Richie Show. Woohoo! Yeah, no guests. Uh, no, just just us talking with you. Uh, to you, I guess, at you, with you. Uh, hopefully, all right, we, we actually have a whole bunch of interesting info today. I mean, I hope it's interesting. We have a whole lot of info coming your way. Um, but we want to answer the basic question that people get to us, like, what do I want to sell online? What should I sell online? Like, um, yeah, we get it all the time. I actually see it in the, in the Equid, in the forums, and in the, you know, questions like they didn't really know what they wanted to sell online. Um, yeah, they saw Shark Tank last night or something. Yeah, and they yeah. got all excited and fired Probably up. Probably is. They're just like looking up online. How do you sell online? You know, I want to do it. Oh yeah, I gotta sell something particular. What do I pick? Yeah, yeah. And I think so. For some people listening, that wasn't a problem. Like the idea was bubbling around in your head, and the first thing you did is went and bought a domain. Probably bought five domains, and uh, some of those you're probably gonna have to let go after that first year. But uh, you might have had your dream started with a product and a domain. You had the whole idea in your head, and you're ready to go. Some of the people, they start with the dream of, I just want to sell online, but I'm not really exactly sure what I want to sell online. Or you're in the middle, and you're thinking, well, I got a few ideas, but I want to, I want to see what other people are doing out there because I want to sell more online. So uh, anyway, uh, Rich, where do you kind of fall on that spectrum here? Again? You know... There, as you're going to see, or as our listeners are going to hear, um, moving forward, there's there's arguments for both. You know, um, I believe in the passion piece, but I also believe that you got to do enough due diligence in your research to know there's a big enough market to actually make a profit with your passion too. Because you got to create so many things, you got to do content. I mean, content is the cost of entry to commerce these days. Yeah, and you know, if you enjoy doing it, you're probably going to have more fun creating that content. And but it's super easy to get kind of caught up thinking, yeah, I'm going to do this new thing for these quilts for my dog. Like my daughter said, oh, let's make Lulu's tutus. Our dog's name is Lulu. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, sounds good. And you probably would have fun putting the tutus on Lulu, but I don't know. Is there a big market for people buying tutus for dogs? I probably doubt it, but you never know. Yeah. So, so really what we're, let me back up a second. We're talking about the difference between passion and profit. Uh, there's, couple different ways of looking at it, right? Like, you know, um, as, as Rich mentioned, like, yeah, do you have a passion for this? That's a really good place to start, right? Because you're going to be creating all this content, right? Like um, there's pictures, there's videos, there's blog posts. You got to write emails. You got to going to have to create a lot of content for this business. And if you like it, that's great. So um, your daughter's probably going to really enjoy making Lulu's tutus, uh, because she loves her dog and uh, loves tutus. Right? Lulu won't like it, probably. Lulu not. is not going to appreciate <laughs> this business at all. Uh, she, she could be an Instagram star, and she's probably not getting any of the profits from that. She'll get so, nicer treats. So, okay, extra treats for Lulu, but otherwise not really profiting all that much. Um, but it's a great it's a great passion project. You'll you know you and the family will enjoy making this. So I I would generally say it's great to start with with passion, right? So if you love it, you're going to, you're going to have more fun making the content. It's going to be a part of your life. Um, a couple examples that we've had that we've, we've taught, we've had on the podcast. So like Kent Rollins, uh, I think he really wakes up in the morning and he's super pumped about cooking over a campfire. Right. Yeah. Uh, so passion is not an, an issue. I mean, you know, it's hot out there, uh, cooking outside. So, so like there's a passion there and it comes through in the videos and, 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 you know, comes through. Um, we had Kiss by a Bee, um, Akila. She comes from a family growing uh, like you know natural all organic foods on the farm, and um, kind of was like a family recipe, I believe, for this this cream. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a passion project. Makes it easier to uh, you know bottle the things and deal with deal with all the things you have to deal with doing business. Um, who else do we have on there? We had Miller Machines. Yeah, Miller Machines. Like he 
works in an orchestra, right? So making the little uh, the little, the little triangle triangles and was it the <laughs> finger symbol or something like that? Like yeah, it was. There was a couple different products he had. It was mostly the specific triangle on your percussionist in an orchestra, right? Super highly specialized. But I mean, man, he's going on the road even going to check out some of these orchestras while they're on the road. So yeah. talk about passion. And he works in orchestras. So like for him, he gets to create content visiting other orchestras around the world. So it's a passion project. He's going to enjoy making it more often. Um, so I, I always think it's best to start with a passion, but let's not get hung up there. You know, like it is, um, the passion's great for when you're in the grind and waking up early, staying up late, but we're in San Diego here. People love surfing, right? So a bunch of surfing bros, they're like, uh, hey, I just want to surf, surf all morning, spend an hour at night working on my, my surfing business, and that's great. But you're not the first guy that had that idea, mm -hmm. right? So, yes, you love surfing. That's great. Um, here's what you need to go surfing. You need a wetsuit, surfboards, wax maybe. Yeah. What else? That's pretty much it. Some waves. Yes, you need waves. <laughs> if you we, could sell waves, that would be awesome. Yeah, great idea. If you can <laughs> sell waves, all right, there's a business out there for you. I think people are actually working on it. Uh, but... They're, you're entering a really crowded market of a bunch of people that love this particular lifestyle, have a passion for it, really tough competition. So um, I applaud the efforts there. A lot of people making surfboards, a lot of people making wetsuits. Just there's not a huge market out there. So you're enter entering a very crowded market. So mm -hmm. be careful with that passion. Um, yeah, you know. I mean, I, I to your point there, we'll kind of be going back and forth on um, not necessarily playing devil's advocate, but maybe exceptions to the rule. So maybe if you already are a professional surfer and you have a following already then great you you're yeah. going to you're going to be just fine you just need to have a product based around your following right maybe a surfboard maybe it's some sort of a towel that you, you know what i mean it's got to be something that's unique but if you have where we're ultimately going with this is yeah, by the way, uh, Kelly Slater, if you're listening, yeah. you can create a surfboard company. <laughs> yeah, Got it. No problem. Yeah, exactly. Right? Uh, and we, who knows? Yeah. Hopefully he's yeah, we, uh, uh, Equitas and Encinitas, there's like a lot of surfers that live there. They're, they have different rules, right? Like, yeah, you can you can start a surfing company. Great. You already, But you already made it. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and that's kind of where we're going, right? It's passion. If you're leading it by passion, it's because you know life in and of itself already has enough challenges. When you start a business and you got an inventory and you got all these other things you got to do, the more passionate you can be about your product and what you're doing is going to drive you through some of the harder hours. At the same time, if you're going solely after profit, um, you could end up also in a very competitive field because if there's profit in that field there's probably going to be a bunch of people there right so there's going to be exceptions to the rules on both and we're going to kind of go through how you're going to find these things and what you're going to do but we just wanted to set the bar with in this podcast that's kind of the two angles we're looking at yep so it's passion versus profit couple on one more example on the passion side we talked a little bit about um knitting let's say you love knitting great um, you know, what is it, what does it cost for a thing of yarn? You know, like five bucks, how long did knitting needles last? You know, probably a lifetime. Um, and actually I've, I've heard of podcasts that people make money uh, in the knitting industry. So I'm not going to say there's, you can't do it, but if that's your passion, it's going to be a tough one. So we're going to switch over to the profit side. Um, so on the profit side, uh, boy, I know a lot of people that sell insurance. I'm not sure of anybody who has a real passion for insurance, but a lot of people need insurance, right? Like I brush my teeth twice a day. If they do, they're the top 10% selling it. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> if you love insurance and you're listening, give us a shout out. Uh, kudos. You're probably really good at it. Uh, Van the man, my, my insurance guy. Like I actually think he really loves insurance and he does great at it. Um, but most people don't. Then uh, another example of uh, toothbrushes, right? Every, almost everybody brushes their teeth at least once a day, probably twice, you know. 
dentists probably say you should do it three times, right? But I don't really love uh, toothbrushes or, or dentists, but there's that new toothbrush out there, the Quip. You I got that? one. You got one? Okay. Yeah. Maybe you love toothbrushes. I don't know. I, I don't, but it was, it was the simple thing of, hey, uh, I just go until this thing stops. It beeps and it tells me to kind of switch a quadrant, beeps, tells me to switch a quadrant, beeps, you know, and then okay. yeah. when it beep, 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 and then shuts off, like, cool, I'm done. I don't have to sing happy birthday four times or whatever the sure. <laughs> recommended amount is. Yeah, but... Uh, there's a huge market for toothbrushes, and in that case, it's an expensive toothbrush. And the people who built it, I, maybe they have a passion for it, right? I, I could be wrong. You know, this is a good point, though, because it's kind of why we said there's always going to be exceptions to the rule. They could have very, very easily said, that's a crowded market. That's gonna, there's big players or the guys with uh, Dollar Shave Club, yep. right? So you could take something that doesn't appear... You know, maybe it doesn't have pa- passion in it, right? It's just a toothbrush. Mm-hmm. But these guys are fanatical about it. And the people who use it, like, I just get it. New one comes every three months, new heads, new battery. Yeah. Boom, travels well, just sticks right on the mirror anywhere I go. So I don't have to worry about, like, where am I putting this in the funky place when I'm traveling somewhere? It just sticks up on the mirror. It's fantastic. Now I'm passionate about my toothbrush. I'd never go back to another one right now. Okay. But I can tell you're kind of like a salesperson <laughs> for Quip. Can we get an affiliate link, uh, Wade? Can we get an affiliate link in here Set for Set it Quip? up in the show notes. Somehow, yeah. Yeah, I think... Uh, we got to move those guys over to Equity. Yeah, only, only fair. Um, so, yeah, did, did the founders of Quip have a passion for it? Let's just... We're going to guess no. They're, they might say they, they did or whatever. But they might have what I would call like a temporary passion. Maybe they just said... They, they use other electric toothbrushes and they're like, there must be a better way. And they just dove in head first and, and kind of went for it. And you can have a temporary passion. Um, I think for another example, I, I, actually there's a lot of people that do baby products that they have this, you know, they have a problem that lasts for like six months. Kids go through phases and then like, it passes oh, or yeah. can't sleep and you got the technique yeah. to get them to sleep. If, yeah, you're, yeah. if your babies can't sleep, like that is the biggest problem in the entire world at that moment. Oh, you I know, like back to that. climate oh. change doesn't even register because your, your kid will not fall asleep. Right. Or w- whatever. Um, so like maybe you don't have a passion for, um, you know, like I saw, I saw this product where they got the baby. What do you call this baby wrapping thing? The baby, the, the method. Uh, the co- co- um, I'll get it here. Yeah, we'll get it. They're like little baby burritos, but that's not what it's called. Yeah, like little baby burritos. You don't have a passion for this, but you invented the, I've seen the one with that's the Velcro on it. Oh, yeah. They didn't have that when my kids were that age. That's genius, yeah. right? And I might have not have had a passion for cloth or Velcro or even babies, other than my own babies, of course, which are the best babies. Uh, but I could really get into that product for a good, you know, six months, couple years, right? If that was like, I think I just have a bigger, better way to, to solve a problem. Um, that's also a way to kind of have a mix of passion and profit. I'm not just doing it for the money. Mm-hmm. I don't really have a passion for this thing, but maybe I can yeah, you have get a passion, into it. A passion to solve the problem, which led to a product that you might not necessarily be passionate about. Absolutely, yeah. And I think there's a lot of examples of that. Um, now, you don't necessarily even need that either. Like you might just, you know, say like, Hey, I just want to, I just want a big market. I want to maybe, uh, maybe you just want to stick, stick with something trendy. Right. Um, we get a lot of customers on Equid. They're just kind of selling the latest trendiest thing. Remember a couple of years ago is the, uh, the fidget spinners, mm-hmm. right? Everybody had fidget spinners. It was the hottest product. Like, yeah, maybe three years ago, two years ago. It's crazy how big it got. Yeah, you're buying them at every like convenience store had fidget spinners, and and you know like where can you buy a fidget spinner right now? Like I don't, they're not even a thing anymore. That, that was yeah. like a. I think the only place I see them anymore is at like trade shows. People still have leftover when they probably got it way back when. <laughs> for sure, yeah. Actually, probably trade shows are a thing. Like people are, want to get a present for the kid, but. What I'm getting at here is that fidget spinners were massive. They were huge for like maybe two years, and then they they dove really fast, you know. And um, another example of that is um, this is almost like a 50, 20 year example of the little RC mini RC racers, mm-hmm. little remote control cars are about 15, 20 bucks, 
and they were really hot for like two Christmases. Yeah, I flipped them at the swap meet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so luckily, I got you, out before I got stuck with boxes. So you rode the trend. Yeah, yeah. like you were like, man, everybody wants these little things. You can buy them in China for a dollar and sell them in the U.S. for twenty bucks. So, you know, that's one of the beauties, by the way, of Equit. Not that we're trying to convince you to go for trending stuff, but for how quick you can spin up a store. You know, I flash back, like if Equid was around when I was growing up, I would just be like, holy crap. I would literally try to ride almost every trend possible. Now, that was just my personality. I like the startup phase yeah. of stuff and probably wouldn't stock a ton of inventory. But it's just for those of you who may have already picked your product and you just love listening to the podcast so you can learn a technique here and there, a strategy here and there, like... That's definitely something worth thinking about is if something's trending, as long as you don't have to, you know, stock massive amounts in your warehouse and might get stuck with it, like, heck, we can, you can spin up a store pretty darn quick. You sure can. I'm not trying to hate on trending products. There's a lot of them. Um, generally speaking, though, those are short-lived businesses and you yeah. don't, you want to be stuck. This is like a game of musical chairs, right? Like you don't want to be the one left without a chair. Um, by the way, this is one of our most popular blogs on Equid.com is the, uh, I believe it's called like 19 trending products. You can just Google trending products on our, on the Google blog and you'll find it. Uh, a lot of good examples there of this particular thing. And, you know, we have to refresh it pretty often because things don't last all that long. Um, kind of also on the profit side, as opposed to the passion side, um, you know, like there's a lot of ways if you want, you, you kind of want to find a big market and you want to find things that sell, but you don't want to find the biggest market. Like you probably don't want to go into the LED TV market and compete against LG and Sony and, and whatnot. Like you have to kind of find this right sweet spot of a big enough market, but where you can find the competition. And just so happens there's this big company out there called Amazon that has um, different categories. Everything's categorized into nice little uh, niches where you can search by top sellers. So you can look for, uh, you know, what, what things sell and, you know, kind of this, the level of the competition because the level of competition is ranked basically right from the top. Mm -hmm. um, so you can go look at directly at Amazon, but there's also a bunch of other companies out there that have access to that data and more data that can kind of help you choose your products. So just a couple examples of those companies. Um, Jungle Scout is a pretty, pretty big name in that. Another one is viral-launch.com. They also have an excellent podcast that I've listened to. Uh, so they can help you if you just don't know what you want to sell. And you can see what is selling on Amazon and where it, where it ranks and how many sell on Amazon. That can give you an idea of you know, the market, not just on Amazon, but you can kind of take that as, as how would that do on e-commerce as well. So just a couple ideas there of... If you have no idea what you want to sell, there's a lot of tools out there. Um, oh, on the trending products, you can use uh, what's the Google the Google Trends mm -hmm. um, trends.google.com trends.google.com. Okay, so check that out. That's for more. It, it, it uh, yeah, it, does, it basically has trends. I mean, I guess mm. it's in the name. So uh, <laughs> trends.google.com. <laughs> <laughs> Don't really have to explain that. Uh, but yeah, that can help you spot things like how did they do relative to the amount of search terms in previous years and things like that. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point because if you think it's, you know, is this just a trend for now, but then you go back and you look, say, under year 2015, 2012, whatever, like you can go back in years too and you see that it's still trending, like, hey, that there's seasonal trends too, right? Sure. Yeah. There's going to be different times. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many freaking options with this. Yeah. Yeah, and Google, and Google Trends isn't used just to find trendy products. Like, maybe you uh, you don't necessarily need to find a trendy. You just want to find something really on the upswing. Um, you know, like, whatever. Things that are being replaced by apps on your phone. Okay, maybe not the best market to, to dive into. Um, or, I don't know, that's just one example. But... You just want to know what you're walking into before you before you start, especially if you don't already have that product chosen. Um, so those are a couple ideas there. But in addition to the things we've mentioned about the passion and the profit, 
There's a lot of different attributes we're going to dive into, but price, market, repeatable business, fanatical customers, an identifiable niche. So this applies to both the passion and the pri- and the passion and the profit. Um, so we'll kind of go into them a little bit more in detail here. Rich is going to try to pick these apart, and we'll uh, we'll kind of just give you some ideas to think about. So the price of the item. And kind of related to that, the price of the entire basket. So when in doubt, my opinion is go with a higher priced item, right? Like you're doing all this work to sell a product. Me personally, I'd rather sell a $100 product than a $10 product because one sale, I might as well make a little bit of money on this. Um, The reason I mentioned the basket size is you might have a product that's 25, but they need to buy several other items in order for it to work, you know, like... Um, maybe it's just, maybe they just need to add batteries to the card. Like that doesn't really work anymore because every people don't buy batteries from regular sites. But, um, in general, if people have to old order multiple things, the price of the product isn't so important. It's the price of the basket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's a good point. Um, definitely get it. People might be sitting there thinking, gosh, I'm just getting started. Like if I'm selling a hundred dollar product, how much is my inventory going to cost? And there's there's workarounds too. Like, let's go back to your total basket comment. You could always bring someone in with a low cost item. I kind of flash back to our fellows at Traffic and Conversion and the, the marketing guys over there where uh, Perry Belcher was starting a store and he undercut everybody with the wicks, but he knew the real money was selling candle wicks the, here, the, just so we. Yeah. 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 yeah, not the... <laughs> so that doesn't get transcribed yeah. around here, yeah. <laughs> Candle wicks. Um, so, yeah, so they, he he was undercutting all the candle wick sellers, and the old school guys were saying, oh, don't worry, he's going to go out of business. But all he was really doing was trying to get the new customer in the front end via that cheaper price. But he knew, well, what the heck, it's not going to be any good without the wax in the essential oils but that's where that total basket could still be a high price for the total basket so yeah, yeah i mean it's the, it i totally get your point and they should be paying attention to that because right, it comes down to advertising right like well yeah i mean and before that it comes down to the the profit margin too so um we're going to get into the advertising but the profit is the so we said price but really, it's price is one part of it. It's profit. Right. Um, if it's a hundred dollar item and you only made ten dollars, that's a big difference than a hundred dollar item where you spent ninety. So, price and profit are 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 very they're similar. They're not the same. Um, you know, like people that are selling, uh, if you're selling like uh, cosmetics, tend to have a high profit margin, right? So, because people don't know what they really cost uh, from the raw materials. If you're selling something that's more of a commodity you can only charge so much more than if people know what it costs in other stores. So price profit, those just go together to can you afford advertising, right? So to me, that's a huge factor in choosing a new product. Um, You can sell things that you can't advertise all day long, right? If you, if you have a huge Instagram following, you don't really need to advertise. That is your advertising. Or if you, um, are willing to create a whole lot of content and get in front of the right people with your um, product, you know, you can do that. $10 products, you can make a lot of money selling $10 products. So I don't want to say you can't do it. It's just you're not going to be able to use a lot of the usual tools in in e-commerce. So, um, you know, like Rich, Lulu's tutus, right? Like Mm -hmm. what's a a dog tutu go for these days? (laughs) 15 bucks, uh, you know. Yeah, no, huh? and how many are they going to buy, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know how many, <laughs> what the basket size is there. Maybe you need more than one tutu. I don't know who buys just one, but at the end of the day, you could make it, um, but you're probably not going to be able to use um, dynamic retargeting or Google shopping ads or AdWords or, you know, like the tools that we talk about on other podcasts, those are probably closed to you. Um, not necessarily, but probably. So just be aware of if low, I, low sales, uh, low cost items with low margin, mm-hmm. uh, those are going to be tough to advertise and you're just kind of taking away half of the, the tools you have at your disposal. So yeah. And you can't, you can't bet, even though we would all love 
you can't place your bets on a viral video. Like we might be able to make a super cute video, mm -hmm. but you can't place your bets on that. Yeah, if your if your product success is dependent upon a viral video or you getting on Shark Tank or you know, as soon as I get this into Target, um, you can make it. I don't want to want to want to be negative here. You can make it, but that you're you're setting yourself up for um, a lot. It's a very high risk venture at this point. So if you're selling something where you can advertise, start building the base, get a customer list, much more likely, uh, you know, road to success there. So that's why we mentioned the advertising. It's not like we're a shill for. Uh, Facebook and Google, but it is the the easiest and most proven way to to build a business online. Um, Rich, this is kind of your your favorite here. The next item is you know kind of a related to the price. It's not just the price of the first sale, you know. It's the yeah. I mean, I just there's there's three ways basically to get money in a business, and we kind of. We covered one, which is get a customer, right? And then we kind of um, started to get into one, but it's really just like it, getting them to come back, right? If you sold Halloween supplies, eh, you might be able to do it. And if you can do a lot real quick, that's cool. But unless you also do costumes for, um, I don't know, theater or I don't I don't even really know I can't really think off the top of my mind but you're that's a one time mm -hmm. type of thing sure right? you, you might get them next year so your repeat purchase is going to be all the way in the next year but if you have back if to, that back yeah. to the dollar shave club yeah if that exactly um, back to dollar shave club or whatever if you can get a repeat purchase or the quip right like we were talking about I every three months get a new new uh, supply of the heads. So basically getting the lifetime value of the customer. We, we talked about an increased basket. We talked about getting a customer, but that repeat purchase and a lifetime value, the second one, getting a customer to come back again. That's where a lot of the exceptions to the rule come in because you could lose, you could technically, if you're selling something that they're going to buy Every month for 200 bucks, I don't know what this product is right now, but... I wish I knew. You know, we'd, we'd get off this I, podcast and I, start I making think them. the food companies that delivered thought this was going to work. They just didn't realize how many other food companies were going to jump in and try to do it. But let's just run with that as an example. If you were selling something that was consumable, that was 200 bucks a month, and they were going to stay with you for six months, nine months, a year, 18 months, you could pay more than the $200 to acquire that customer. And it wouldn't hurt you as much because you have these future, you know, 1,000, 1,500, 1,600, however, however long they stay as customers. But yeah, the repeat purchase, that's something that when it comes to passion or profit, I think that's where we like the fanatical, you touched on that earlier, the, those super fans, the fans that are just, because they might buy things in different forms, right? They're, they're you're from Minnesota, you love the Minnesota Vikings. So like if someone could buy you a Minnesota Vikings jersey, they could buy you a calendar, they could buy, like you could literally buy so many different things. It doesn't always have to be that same thing too. But just that lifetime value or repeat purchase, that's a huge thing to think about in your business. Absolutely. So yeah, high price, high margin, repeat purchase, all good things. They don't ha you don't have to get all of them, but those are kind of the, the things you're looking for as you're looking for new products. Um, we talked a little bit about the size of the market. So size of market is a little bit of a, you know, like you want a, you want a bigger market like Miller Machines. There's only so many people that are buying a specific amount for a uh, triangle for an orchestra. Now, there's way more people that buy drums, but then the higher up you go in the market, the more people you're also competing with. So there is a sweet spot to the size of the market. Um, so it's not always that the bigger the market, the better, because you're just running into more competitors. But you want to kind of get an idea of the size of the market. Um, and kind of the, the inverse of that is this is the niche. So yeah, you want a nice niche. It's not really the inverse, I guess. I would say it's more 
can you identify the niche, right? Like um, people, so people that love whiskey, for instance, they're, they're probably put it in their Twitter, Twitter bio or their Facebook or they join Facebook groups about whiskey or, you know, there, there's ways to identify them. Mm-hmm. Uh, earlier, you were uh, resting on the couch and you had some uh, special little gel packs under your back because your, your back hurt, right? Mm-hmm. There's a product for that and it makes sense, but you did not join the Facebook group, My Back Hurts. Right. You know, so yes, there's a product and there is a niche, but it's probably not identifiable. If it's not identifiable, you can't market to it easily. So it's not just a niche that you're looking for. You're looking for it identifiable. And um, Facebook probably knows that niche. They probably, kn- they probably know that you need a, a nice pack, actually. But, you know, <laughs> let's not get too crazy. <laughs> but um, you want it to be a sort more identifiable without some crazy algorithm being able to, to pick that out of thin air. Mm-hmm. So um, competitors, right? Like kind of goes along with that when I mentioned the market size. So, yeah, you don't want to be too big of a market. You also, you just don't want to go against the, this, these uh, entrenched competitors so much, right? Like, yes, um, you know, for clothes and things like that, there's always openings. Um, if you want, let's stick with the toothbrush. If you got a great idea for a awesome electric toothbrush, man, there's a lot of competitors in there. Doesn't mean it didn't work for Quip, so I'm, I'm saying both things. They were able to beat the, the Phillips and all the other, uh, and water pick and all the other things, but now there's a new big dog in there. And how many millions of dollars would it take to develop the next product to beat them? Mm-hmm. Probably a lot. So, you know, take a look at your competitors out there. And I'm always surprised by people who don't just Google it or put the name of the product in Amazon. You know, what do you see right there? If the first page of Amazon looks like, wow, oh, those are pretty good products, really good reviews. I don't know how they made it for that price, right? Like, I can't even make it for that price. Okay, that's probably not a good market, just just saying. And people don't check this, and then later on they, they say, well, I can't make it. I'm just getting killed by Amazon. Well, you didn't, you know, check it. Yeah, that's <laughs> interesting. I, there's one thing I thought about as you were saying that right now. Now, because, again, we're trying to poke holes to find there's always exception. This is more of a thought-provoking on different ways for you to think about what product you should pick. But... You could take that list that you're referring to. You went to Amazon. You see, wow, these are lots of great products. But if you took the time real quick and you looked in at the reviews and you start to see a common trend of, wow, all of these, everyone complains about this one thing that none of those people are doing, you might be on to something then, right? Very much Again, so, Again, yeah. just exception to the rule, not not trying to yeah. t- tear anything apart. There's, there's always going to be... And it, the, it kind of just leads me back to, we won't go deep on this, but it's it really is the importance of brand because it's the one thing that kind of is ahead of all these things, whether it's passion, profit, whatever. Like if you if you sell something and you're just a commodity, if you're just going for the lowest cost and the fastest, like you're going to lose out someday. I can't predict when that day is going to be, but you're going to lose out. And it's probably going to be, to the big dog, the Amazon, right? They, they, Bezos said straight out he wants to carry every single skew on the planet. So when they got the data and they know and the only thing you're doing is the lowest cost, like probably going to be a race to the bottom. But to keep in point with what you're saying there, Jess, if you see a bunch of people are doing it, but you can do it in a different way and they're complaining across the board on all those products and you can come in and do that and solve that problem, you might actually don't know how long you have that wave because they got a lot of money. They might be able to fix it quick too. But if you created a brand around, you were the one who fixed that, you never know. Might be the very place to enter. For sure. Yeah. Like, and actually that's a very good strategy that other people are using to, you know, use Amazon's data to find those right products. So for sure. Just making sure that if everybody's got, uh, you know, 4.8 stars and, you know, like everything looks good, then be a little bit of afraid as well. So just want to make sure that you don't start spending a lot of money in an area and you haven't checked it on Amazon and or Google. I mean, it doesn't take long. So please, please do that uh, and just be aware. 
A uh, couple at last items here on that apply to both. Like these don't aren't necessary, but like, do you know if people search for it? Right? Um, do uh, meaning search for it? Like, is there identifiable terms for it? Right? Like electric toothbrush. Yep. Okay. People do search for that. You can still have the best electric toothbrush, but if you're c- complete creating a whole new category that people aren't searching for yet, that's going to be harder. Doesn't mean you don't do it. Just means people aren't searching for your product a little bit harder. Uh, kind of related to that. Well, not related, but it doesn't look good in a picture, right? Like all the social media uh, platforms are, right now are, are generally visual. So if your product is going to stand out and look recognizable as people are scrolling with their thumb on a mobile phone, that's a big advantage. If it doesn't look that good or it's sort of intangible or it, you just don't even know what it is when you look at it, it's a bit of a negative in this area. So I don't have a good example there, but uh, just think if uh, there's an influencer on Instagram that you see it and they're like holding it up at the beach, uh, that's probably a good answer. <laughs> if you're like, what is this weird industrial uh, widget here? I don't know what this is. That's bad. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's it's a good point. They talk about that. Let's go back to Shark Tank for a minute. Like if you could have an amazing product that sells or excuse me, that uh, solves a problem. But unless you create amazing content, so this kind of go back to it. Well, you sell a product that's not necessarily amazing to look at as far as the product itself. But when you finish the product, right. And Jesse sells fish also. And so if, if, if he's sold by just the picture of the filet before it was cooked, good luck. But you know, you, here's this product that's finished. Here's this nice looking recipe, a great picture on there. That might, that might be something that actually might sell. But where I'm actually going with that is, um, if content is the cost of entry and you have to explain your product, if you can't make it look good in a picture, you better be making content that at least explains what you solve. For sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's just so many different nuances in this, right? Cause it's not just one platform too. Look at all these different platforms. It's kind of back to the passion and profit in the beginning. If you have so many different things you need to do, we both like the passion. In addition to that, if you're passionate about something, other people might be passionate about it. And it's kind of why you brought up that like, does it look good in a picture? Cause you're trying to get people's attention of something that somebody else is interested in. Yeah. Yeah. And I mentioned the, the picture is just, you know, Hey, if, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, Snapchat, TikTok, all these things that relies on somebody's got to recognize what this thing is in the fraction of an instant or their thumb keeps moving and scrolling up. So doesn't mean you doesn't mean it has to look good on TikTok, right? But it, it's going to help for a lot of products. Um, all the items we just mentioned, you don't need to have every single one of those. You don't need a perfect fit on every single thing we talked about. Those are just things that I would think about. And I've went into businesses that uh, don't meet all those things. And sometimes I kick myself later and sometimes I'm like, well, you know, it is what it is. You're not going to get the perfect, you're not going to get the perfect thing on these. So just be aware of those. And that helps. I hope it helps in your decision making process. Um, So now we kind of talked about a bunch of the attributes that we would look for in a product to sell. Um, Now, where the heck do you get these things? So um, they're probably not, you, you know, you have to create them at some level. You, you can't just create them out of thin air. 3D pin- printing is like, eh, not quite there yet. So <laughs> let's, let's, let's forget that as an option. Um, my, boy, my first area would be like check local, right? Like um, depends on where you live. But generally speaking, somebody locally can probably help you make this product um, or at least some of the components of it. And it's going to be so much easier to work locally. So, of course, this depends, right? Like, you know, if it's something crafty, you can probably find somebody local. If you're making high-end le- electronics, you're probably not making that here. You're, you're going to be on a plane going to, you know, going to China, going to Taiwan. So, of course, it depends. But in general, 
uh, using local connections, local tradespeople is probably a good place to start. Beyond that, though, going just another step up is trade shows. So I think a lot of people discount that, that there's, you know, Google it. There's probably a trade show for every type of category you can think of. They might do them a couple times a year even. So um, if you, and maybe they might not have the perfect product, but they at least have something similar, and then you can talk to the people and get that made. So that's if you want to stick to your own country, um, you know, just look for the trade shows, right? So that's a easier tip there. On a more on the easier side, less of, uh, you know, less investment is drop shipping. So, uh, yeah, kind of good. What do you got? A, what do you got that Rich? one's an interesting one, right? I think, I think we both kind of have mixed feelings on that one. It's, it's great in that the cost of inventory, you don't have to house the inventory. You don't have to store the inventory. You don't have to pay for everything ahead of time. Um, but you're kind of building someone else's brand and there could be a bunch of other people selling it, but like, you know, we talked about this a little bit before we've, how long now have we been here in 10 plus years, drop shipping's dead. And then you keep on seeing someone else come through and make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. Drop shipping is dead. That's been a blog title for so many years and yeah, and I still see businesses all the time making a whole bunch of money doing drop shipping. And I'm like, how do they make the margins and how do they, you know, but they do it. So, um, you know, it takes unique to unique spots where I'd caution people is that if you are starting drop shipping by you're going to sign up with one of the big drop shippers. There's a lot of people out there that do this, some that connect with Equid and if you are choosing like a handful of products that really fit your store and your niche, great. I think you can do something with that. If you said, I'm going to choose every single product they have and just throw it on your site and hope for the best, boy, I'm a little, I'll just hesitate a little bit. You know, if you're, you're basically saying, I'm going to make a bad looking Amazon with higher prices and not the same customer service. Like, Good, good luck. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> I, I mean, hey, kudos if you can make it. I'm just sort of surprised. So I think me personally, drop shipping is like it has some places where it might really make sense, small niches, or you are talking directly with uh, the factory that they'll drop ship on your behalf. That makes sense. Um, I have done drop shipping in the past, so it did work for a while. Um, so Drop shipping is a it, like it gets a lot of buzz in the market, so it can work. Just make sure to expand your mind beyond drop shipping. I would say. So, with that, my next example is actually drop shipping. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a different type of drop shipping. It's more print on demand. So print on demand is actually drop shipping, but. Um, we have a connection with Printful. I think we have some other connections as well. We've had Printful on a podcast a while back. Um, what they will do is they have probably, I don't know, a couple hundred different items. But let's just start with hats and T-shirts as an example. Hats, T-shirts, coffee mugs. Yeah. Yeah. All the, all the kind of the, the basics like that. But quite a bit more, too. I don't want to. But let's just stick with if you have the best idea ever for an awesome T-shirt, um, Hey, you might have a business right there. You don't have to buy one T-shirt even to to do this. So you can get the design created, um, and then you can advertise like even an image of this, but you didn't even print the T-shirt yet. And then as soon as it sells, they will automatically ship it for you for a fee. You can still make decent money uh, doing that, and you actually hold no inventory. So for some people, I think that's an awesome idea. Um, if it's business just on that. That's one thing. You can also, if you have branded, um, if you have a store and you also want to have t-shirts and hats, but you don't want to have uh, a one of every size, right? Like then this is an, a good opportunity as well to make a little extra money from a store. So yeah, no, I mean, that, this is a perfect one to bring up on this podcast with passion and profit, right? So some people, let's just, what is, let's just go into that word profit for a little bit. That's all relative. Some people want to completely change their life and be the next internet millionaire. Their level of profit is going to 
be totally different, then there could be someone listening to this show that if they could just make 500 extra dollars so they could pay for a new car payment and some insurance, you know, they would be perfectly happy. So first off, we will keep in mind that. So, and the reason I'm bringing that up is what do you want to be doing all day? If you're creative and you're looking at this print on demand thing and what you want to be doing is creating t-shirt designs, then this could be perfect for you. It, you, you won't keep all the margin if you were buying the t-shirts yourself and you were printing them yourself and you, but that might not be what you really want to be doing back to the You could also side. be doing a lot of printing labels and go in the post office a lot. Too. Yeah, exactly. And so in this case, you could just stick in your passion and cr be creating these designs. You don't have to buy the t-shirts. You don't have to print the t-shirts. You don't have to ship t-shirts. So yeah, you don't get all the margin. You get some of the margin, but you don't have to do a darn thing except do what you love doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I just want to make sure people are aware of this option, right? Like it's a very good option. If you particularly if your question is, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I want to sell. Well, do you have a good saying, catchphrase, a brand, a logo, anything like that, that you could just start selling tomorrow? Um, it's a good, good option for you. Um, all right. So the next option is, um, this is kind of, this is, probably where a lot of people are making a lot of money. This is overseas. So, hey, just a little newsflash here. A lot of products are not made in your country. If you're in the U.S., a lot of products are not made here. Just, just a heads up. It's probably made in China uh, or it's made in Asia. Um, in order to tap that, there's a lot of ways to tap that, but I mean, the easiest one is go to Alibaba. So Alibaba is a, uh, I guess we'll call it a marketplace but it connects Chinese manufacturers with the rest of the world. Um, almost any product you can think of is probably listed there. So be careful. If you go to Alibaba, do not, within the first hour, wire somebody $10,000. Like that is just, that's insane. Don't do that. But do spend some time there. Try to find the uh, close, um, like a, a similar product that what you have in mind and then start talking to people, have a conversation. It's probably going to be over Skype. It's going to be, it's going to take a little bit there. You know, you're going to have to kind of sort through some, some good and bad answers. Um, and you can buy directly from there. The next level up from that is there's a lot of brokers um, in that will help you navigate China. It's a different, different culture. Just business is a little bit different. A lot of people on Alibaba are actually brokers themselves. So they're actually a front for a factory that may not as be as savvy in the online world. So it depends on how big you want to be. If you're saying I'm going to spend a couple thousand bucks on some products from China, you want to roll the dice. Great. Just again, make sure you've done some research, kind of ch check it out. Dude, there, make sure there's a smell test here. Uh, use your spidey sense, I guess. I, I don't know. Um, but if you're spending, you know, once you're into the five figures and higher, and you're really serious about this, like go to China, right? Like go there, see the factory, make sure you see this products going off the line. Um, there's another level of brokers that were, are basically there to help people from other countries um, with translation and stuff. So from the U S you want an English speaker in China that will help. They sometimes take a fee as well, usually take a fee or a commission. Um, but I've heard from people that that actually, they save them way more money than it costs them for the services. So I don't want to go way in depth in like going, uh, you know, like navigating China uh, to buy your products. But there's a lot of people that right now, if you if you want to create a new product that you can't find here, um, that's probably the answer. And you don't necessarily just need to navigate with Alibaba alone. You may want to go there. You may want to work with brokers that do that. Um, if you're if you're kind of just more like searching about like there's it's called the Canton Fair. It's uh, outside of Hong Kong. I believe it's in January, February, something like that. Um, but that is sort of the, I don't know, call it the biggest trade show in the world, I guess. I, I don't know, Rich, what have you, you kind of... Yeah, Robbie used to go there. Yeah there's, yeah, there's quite a few people I know that go to that one. Yeah, so if you're like, man, I'm really wanna, I really want to sell something. I have no idea what it is, and I have the time and, and the, the money to invest, just go there, right? Like, it'll be overwhelming, and uh, but you will find everything under the sun at one trade fair. 
Um, so we mentioned all the other, there's a lot of other trade fairs for specific niches um, all around the world, but the biggest one is the Canton Fair. So, um, all right. Last one on the list of where to make your own products. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, you literally can create your own, right? You can start with a block of wood, Rich, and a knife, and you can carve <laughs> a statue, right? Now, um, like, of course, yeah, this is, this is real, this is old school entrepreneurship. Like, yeah, create your own product. Talk, stop talking about China and all this, having somebody else make your stuff. Make your own product, right? Like, yeah, of course. And, um, you know, with that, like, you, you're going to navigate the patent process. Um, we're not talking about statues. You can, yes, of course, you can uh, st- make a statue yourself. But we're not talking about crafts. We're talking about products. You're going to navigate the patent process. You're going to navigate the manufacturing process. We had a good podcast on this. Um, what was the um, – oh, it was Road Trip Potty. Um, oh, yeah. So here's the perfect example, you know, where some people will ask, like, what are some of the things that can sell online? Yeah. Like, and you never come up with it. Like, this was a mix, kind of a hybrid of could you profit off of something that someone was passionate about this person – was, it was road trip potty, and this woman just basically got stuck in traffic, and she's it was bad. You gotta <laughs> go, you gotta go, Rich. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, she was so inspired because this happened, I guess, more and more frequently, that she was like, "I I gotta I gotta fix this problem." Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she created a literally a little urinal for women to be able to. A female urinal. Do yes. their do their do on the, well, not their do, <laughs> do their thing, sorry. Let's, let's, that reel, was a, let's well. reel it back here, Rich. Uh, but yes, you know. Not literally the do. Uh, do their thing uh, <laughs> on the, uh, <laughs> on their road trip. But she solved, she solved a problem. But I mean, would you dream that up? Like it had, she had to go through that. A few times, right? Like, it's not like, I got an idea. I'm just going to make this product for people. On. But she's been doing great. Yeah. And she went through the process of creating her own product from, from the, you know, like, you're talking, um, oh boy, with 3D modeling and, you know, the CAD, yes, CAD process was the thing I was missing there and going through the patent process and find lo- local manufacturers. So, um and that's probably the vision we, you know, we probably should have started with that because that's like how people think it's always done. The other answers we just gave you are really more of um, just kind of shortcuts or different alternatives to the I must invent a product and get it created and manufactured. Yes, you can do that. That sometimes takes a couple of years, I think was her process, was several years to take that from idea to, to product to market. Um, and by the way, there's a lot of people that can help you with that process. I know she recommended her, um, the people that helped her out with the patent process specifically. Um, we have some uh, friends, colleagues that have used a company called Pro Product. Am I spelling that right, Rich? P R O W. Yeah, I don't remember the exact spelling. I'll look it up real quick while we're talking. But yeah, Proud. No, actually, it's Proud with P R O U. Yeah, so Proud and Product, and you know. I guess uh, we're on audio, so it <laughs> doesn't really matter how I spelt it. <laughs> but uh, just one example of, and there's a bunch of people that can help you out, take a product from concept through the patent process and then get it manufactured overseas. So that can short, shorten that um, time frame from, you know, probably not going to happen overnight, but it can happen in the process of a few months. Um, so if you really have the best idea and you have a little more money than you have time, I would look into people that can help you with product development. Um, so, and just to clarify, yes, it is product. P R O U D U C T. All right. Dot com. Dot com. All right. Let's, hey, give him a shout out. Uh, I don't even know him personally, but uh, all right. Rich, that was a pretty uh, information jam packed podcast there. You got some ideas that you want to run by? You know, going to start a new business here today? Yeah, you know, I mean, that actually, every time we do these podcasts, there's always something I want to go start to apply. And, you know, I'm just remembering now just how easy Equid really is. And I'm going to sit here and kind of look through Google Trends and look through some more stuff and be like, hey, what can I throw up here before the holidays? Uh, perfect, man. You know, it's uh, it's Friday. We can go uh, go have a have a drink here. And, you know, think of some ideas. Um 
what I'm hoping people are getting here is that like, if you've listened, I hope at this point you cannot say, I don't know what product to sell online or I don't know where to find products to sell online. There's a bunch of ideas. If it were that easy, everybody would already be doing it. So you're going to have to do a little bit of legwork, but hopefully we've given you 10 or 15 different places to start your journey. Get out there, start selling. Rich, got any other last little questions here? Last, last comments? No, that's it. Now I'm just literally, I'm starting to look. See, I've, ar- I've already lost you <laughs> again. We're gonna I'm, have to I'm start now signing up for another Equid store. An- another brainstorming <laughs> session here is about to start. So everybody, hopefully you're brainstorming. Think of some ideas and already turned off this podcast. If not, get out there, make it happen. Hey, this is Jesse and Rich. We want to let you know we really appreciate you listening. We hope you find the tips we give you helpful for growing your business. You can find all of our past episodes and a lot more useful stuff at equi.com forward slash podcast. And also check us out on your favorite podcasting platform like Apple Podcast or Stitcher and make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing. Be sure to let us know what you think by rating and reviewing so we can serve you better. So subscribe on your favorite platform. And come join our community, check out the transcripts, or tell us why you would be a great guest at equid.com forward slash podcast.